Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for being here and tuning in on the Zoom. I'm Nathan. I'm going to be talking today about some of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks trout population data that we collect in both Silver Bow Creek and the Mainstem Clark Fork River. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to mention our partner agency, the Natural Resource Damage Program. A lot of the work I'm going to be talking about today wouldn't be uh, possible without uh, help from them in terms of funding our monitoring program. Probably just stopped because and we'll go. I can, I can find another way to. Yep, we'll go. Okay. Yeah, try now. Okay. And like I said, today I'm going to focus in on Silverbow Creek, which hopefully all of you know is, uh, has the Tedwaters here near Butte. It flows downstream where it becomes the Clark Fork River uh, after the confluence of Warm Springs Creek. And Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does estimates all throughout Silver Bow Creek and the Upper Clark Fork River. And that's the kind of data I'm going to be focusing on a little later in my talk. Also, you may know that these streams are within the Clark Fork Superfund complex, um, which again spans all the way from Butte downstream to the former Milton Reservoir, which is just upstream of Missoula. But first, I thought we'd start with a little fisheries timeline. Uh, you know, mid to late 1800s, extensive mining operations get underway in Butte. Those mines take a lot of stuff out of the earth, pile them up in tailings piles in and around Butte. And it, in the early part of the 1900s, a series of large floods washed a lot of that material downstream and deposited it along the floodplain of the Clark Fork River and Silver Bow Creek. And a lot of those floodplain tailings deposits are still with us today. Many of them have been cleaned up, particularly on Silver Bow Creek. But many of those contaminants are still there. From around 1911, 1916, the Warm Springs Settlings Ponds were constructed and they were constructed to capture and treat contamination coming downstream from the mines in Butte. Those ponds were expanded and improved in 1959. And following that expansion, water quality improved downstream of the ponds to such a level that trout started to reappear in the Upper Clark Fork River for the first time in decades. However, there would be periodic fish kills in the Clark Fork for the decades to come. And during this time, Silver Bow Creek was still fishless. And in fact, it was devoid of all aquatic life. Not even aquatic insects could survive there. Then in the 1980s, we get CERCLA and Serp Superfund. And what Superfund did was provide a legal mechanism for the state to pursue funding to clean up these contaminants and to do restoration actions. And as part of these activities, the Milltown Dam was removed in 2009. Cleanup activities on Silverbow started in the late 1990s. Um, went through about 2014, 2015 with some spot cleanups in 2016. And shortly after these, the cleanup started, uh, in fish, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Park surveys, we found the first fish in Silver Bow Creek in over 100 years. And those were a sucker and sculpin species that were found just right in Butte and just downstream in the Rocker area. 2014, started to find trout in Silver Bow Creek more in more downstream reaches near German Gulch. And I'll talk more about sort of the evolution and the colonization of the trout fishery in Silver Bow Creek later in the talk here. 2013 cleanup started on the Clark Fork River proper. You know, those, those, um, that cleanup is still underway. Uh, they're, right now they're focusing just downstream of Deer Lodge uh, on the Grant Corps National Historic Site. And while that cleanup's going on, there's also extensive tributary restoration activities going on. And from a fisheries perspective, these tributary restoration actions are really important because fish really need to move around to complete their life histories. For instance, trout like to go up into tributaries to do uh, their spawning, and then their offspring often will out-migrate from those tributaries downstream back into the main stem later in their life. So there's a real 
uh, important biological connection between these main stem habitats that I'm going to primarily talk about today and the tributaries, but I just wanted to mention that tributaries are also important. And some of the sort of monitoring and research that we do at, at Fish, Wildlife and Parks, um, well, we do a lot of stuff. We do what I'm just lumping into lab studies. We do things like test fish for metals levels. Uh, we coordinate with universities on graduate research projects. Um, for years, we did a cage fish study where we put hatchery trout in these little boxes up and downstream on the Clark Fork River and saw how well they survived over time, as well as how many metals they were accumulating over time. And we've done a lot of tagging and movement studies, and we'll probably continue to do a lot of tagging and movement studies where we put tags in fish, follow them around, see where they go and when. But kind of our bread and butter of the monitoring program is our electrofishing data. And we do that in both the tributaries and the main stem. And the way electrofishing works is you just put electric current, electric current in the water. And if you do it right, fish will actually be attracted to it and swim towards it and possibly become stunned and you can net them up and then do what you will with them. Um, so we do a lot of that in the tributaries. We also do a lot of it in um, the main stem habitats. So when I say the main stem, I'm really talking about Silver Bow Creek proper, as well as the Upper Clark Fork River proper. Um, I mean, mostly going to be focusing on the main stem electrofishing data today, but um, I just thought to mention that there's a host of things that we continue to do to try to put together this puzzle, this jigsaw puzzle um, of the trout population dynamics within this basin. Before we start looking at some actual data, I thought I should talk about, well, why are we collecting this data? Why monitor in the first place? Well, restoration and cleanup are expensive. They're very expensive. And we want to make sure that those activities are meeting their goals. Um, and we want to help guide those activities to get the best possible outcomes. And we want to do that while those things are underway. We don't want to wait until um, they're completed and then wish we wish we had done something differently. We want to take kind of an adaptive management approach and help steer things in the right direction. And then last but not least uh, is public interest. There's a lot of public interest in terms of how are the fish responding to all this work that's going on? Uh, how is the fishing right now? What, how is it going to be in the future? Is it getting better? And a good example of um, when we got a lot of public interest in, in this kind of stuff is when we had a fish kill in the Clark Fork River just downstream of Warm Springs last fall, last September. We documented a pretty significant but fairly localized fish kill. Again, I'll get into that a little bit more, but stuff like that really gets folks interested. They want to know well, okay, now there's some dead fish in the river. What does that mean to the fishery as a whole? How is the fishing going to be? Am I going to be able to catch fish here um, next year, for instance? So let's take a look at some actual monitoring data. So that map there that you're looking at shows seven sampling sections that we do on the upper Clark Fork River every year. We usually do it in the spring uh, around April. And that's those little stars there. They go from Warm Springs all the way down to the Bear Mouth area. And the graphs are our trout population estimates. And we express those as fish per mile of river. Um, so the gray bars there are our brown trout population estimates and our white bars are cutthroat and rainbow trout estimates. And so those are the main trout species we find in these wa waters. Um, and the red line there is the mean brown trout population estimate for that individual section. So these are four different sections that are downstream of Deer Lodge. And I kind of separate upstream and downstream from Deer Lodge for reasons that I'll kind of get into. Um, but what we generally see in these, these four downstream sections is that while well, they each support different numbers of fish, right, if you look really carefully at that y-axis, the barrowmouth um, section, you know, kind of maxes out at, at about 100 fish per mile, depending on the species. Whereas in Will, that Williams Taverner, we usually see much higher population estimates on any given year. So there's really a lot of variation as you go up and downstream um, in terms of fish numbers. 
But these sections downstream of deer ledge, they tend to be less variable over time. And um, they also are sort of following a different pattern than the ones upstream of deer lodge, which I'm going to show you right now. So these are three sections upstream of deer lodge. Um, and if you, you can see that there's kind of a different pattern where we've seen a really pretty sharp decline in the last few years in our estimates, in our brown trout estimates. And, sh and I should note that brown trout comprise 99% of the trout population in these sections. There are cutthroat and rainbow trout there, but there's just not enough of them to generate reliable population estimates. So that's why you don't see any white bars here. Um, but like I said, in these sections, we've seen a pretty severe decline in our recent sampling, particularly in this most upstream section, the pH shack section, which is just downstream of Warm Springs Creek. Um, and that's a really interesting section because it, it's one where we see some years the highest population estimates of anywhere on the upper Clark Fork River. And you can see 2013, we had about 1800 fish per mile there. And then you compare that to spring of 2019, our estimate was 32 fish per mile. So a decrease from 2000 to 32 is enough to make us think, well, there's something, there's something going on here. There's, this is beyond just our normal up and down that is normal for trout populations. And that pH shack section is also one that's interesting because we have a long-term data set there. We've been sampling that one going back to the 70s. And um, you can see that, you know, back in the 80s, there are a lot of fish in that section. Uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon to have 2,500 fish per mile in that section. And again, you compare that to what we're seeing now in 2019, that's a large decrease. And it begs the question, well, what is going on there? Well, something that we know that drives some of the variation in these fish numbers, particularly in this pH shack section, are flow conditions, or at least they used to. So just sort of anecdotally, we would no notice that after a couple good flow years, for instance, 2010, 2011 were good flow years. About three years later, we would see a big spike in fish numbers. And so that, you know, that, that big spike in 2013 I talked about is kind of an example of that, where we had good flows in 2010, three years later, we get a lot of fish in our estimate. And in fact, that relationship with flows is so strong that um, we could actually predict the number of fish we were catching based on flows three years prior. And the reason there's kind of this three year lag is because we're only effective, we're only good at catching fish that are about 10 inches and bigger and those fish we figure are about three years and older. So those flow conditions during those, the fish's first year of life are really important apparently for their survival and the recruitment to later age classes so that we can catch them in our estimates and then also anglers can catch them as well. And so there was a really tight relationship between minimum flow conditions, that minimum low flow during the summer three years ago and how many fish we would catch in our estimates three years later. And so in terms of hydrograph, you can think of those low flows as these sort of reverse peaks down at the bottom. And like I said, that was a pretty good predictor of, of how the population was doing and how we were, um, how many fish we'd catch in during our estimate. But starting a few years ago, 2018, 2019, our, our data no longer fit that model. These flows are no longer a good predictor of um, trout abundance in the future. And in fact, the, the population is declining to a point that this model no longer fits. So again, makes us scratch our head. Well, what's going on here? Well, since this is the Upper Clark Fork River and it has a legacy of mining contamination that's still with us today, you know, metals are likely suspect. And a good sort of reminder of this, uh, these legacy, mining legacy impacts are these, what we call slicken areas. And so this, this is a picture of a slick and it's basically an area that's so contaminated that very little or no vegetation can grow on it. And they're very common on the Clark Fork River and they used to be common on Silver Bowl Creek uh, before the cleanup here. Um, and these slick and areas are particularly concerned because they have high levels of contamination. You can see this blue tinted water, which is characteristic of copper. 
blue tinted rocks at sort of the toe of this slicken right here that we found one day, actually the day we went out there to examine that fish kill. Um, and so these slicken areas are, you know, of, of, of high concern to us right now because in fact, last year when we went out um, and responded to the report of that fish kill that I mentioned earlier, we started seeing them just downstream of some pretty nasty slicken areas. So um, this is a picture of three meander tabs um, with slicken areas on them. And as after we got the report of the fish kill, which happened over a weekend, we went out Monday morning, started walking down the stream and just downstream of this slicken on the top part of the screen here, we started seeing dead fish. And so that made us think, well, there's, there's something going on with this particular area that might have been particularly uh, bad in terms of contamination. And another thing that happened that weekend was there was heavy, very heavy thunderstorms. Um, actually two of them that happened, one on Friday and apparently another one on Saturday. And we could see evidence of that. Um, but the fact that these slickens um, erode and cause contaminants to get into the river is it's not a revelation. This isn't something new. And in fact, Atlantic Richfield back in the 80s built berms around these things. You can actually, if you look carefully at this picture, these sort of fine lines are these um, piles of slicken material. They used the local material, which was contaminated, um, to build a berm around these things and try to ring them in and, cont and contain all that contamination and keep it from eroding into the river. But what we've been seeing in the past few years is those berms are starting to fail. And we saw um, right after that fish kill that on this particular slick, slick and right about right here, it looked like the berm had just failed that weekend. And so all that rain came in. Um, I actually have pictures of that. All that rain came in and filled up that, that meander tab, that slick in, like a pond. And we could tell it ponded because if you look really carefully, there's sort of this debris line around the outside of the, of, of the berm. This is what's left of that berm. Not much in that particular spot. And so it filled up like a pond and then it failed catastrophically, basically popped right here. And all that contaminated water and, and uh, associated contaminants probably spilled very rapidly into the Clark Fork River in high concentration. And it happened in September during a time when the river was very low. So that probably um, contributed to high elevations of metals such as copper at that time. So that caused us to, to think, well, how many of these other high risk slickens are out there? This can't be the only one that's um, dumping material into the river and potentially causing fish kills. So this past summer, we partnered with the Clark Fork Coalition and we did a slick and risk assessment we went out and inventoried every slicken we could find from Warm Springs all the way down to Deer Lodge. And we assigned them risk categories. And that's what those little dots on this map um, represent. So basically the bigger the dot, the more red it is, the higher risk they are. And we found quite a few high risk um, slickens. And following this fish kill and following our, uh, our risk assessment, the state, specifically the Natural Resource Damage Program, uh, contracted out some work where they basically went and rebuild some of these berms. So this is that same slicken I was just showing you. It's number six on the map here. And they went in and put these straw bale structures in to try to again contaminate that material and keep it from running off during those rain events. Now these were put in as sort of a short-term fix, just good for a year, maybe two, because this is in an area that's gonna be uh, cleaned up relatively soon by DEQ. So this is just to buy some time until cleanup can come through and take these things out completely because that's ultimately the only long-term solution to all this. However, there's other areas downstream, farther downstream towards Deer Lodge that are not gonna be cleaned up for years. So right now we're sort of struggling with, okay, how do we, um, how do we deal with those things? I think things we can do or the ways we, we can address those sooner rather than later um, so that they, that material doesn't end up in the river before cont um, cleanup can come through and completely remove it. So 
sort of shifting from an area where cleanup is sort of in its early stages and underway to an area where cleanup is done. I'm going to start talking about Silver Bowl Creek. And in Silver Bowl Creek, prior to the start of cleanup, <clears throat> like I said earlier, there were no fish in the main stem of Silver Bowl Creek. It was just too contaminated. However, we did have trout living in the tributaries, some of the major tributaries such as Blacktail Creek, upstream of town, German Gulch, and Browns Gulch. And you know, typically fish you might find there are non-native rook trout and native West Slope cutthroat trout. Then shortly after the cleanup started, during one of our surveys, we found sculper, sculpin and suckers uh, just downstream of Butte here near the LAO area and in Rocker. A few years later, we found, found those same species downstream of German Gulch. We established a new sampling section down the stream of German Gulch, which I'm going to talk about sort of continuously through my uh, Silver Gulf section here. Because that was also the same spot where we found trout for the first time in, in 2006. It was a non-native brook trout, but still we were very glad to see it. The next year, we found the first native West Slope cutthroat trout. And that, again, in that same German goat section. And we also found brook trout uh, near Ramsey, if you're familiar with that, between I-15 and uh, Miles Crossing during Canyon area. And uh, we also found brook trout uh, just downstream of Butte again. Then fast forward to 2010, we start seeing trout basically in all of our sampling sections, including one downstream at the uh, Highway 1 bridge on the way to Anaconda. We're seeing native West Slope cutthroat trout recolonizing farther upstream towards Butte. And this sort of species distribution is very similar to what we see today during our surveys. Um, in terms of abundance, we tend to see the most trout in our section just downstream of German Gulch. So that's why I crudely sort of cut and paste all these little trout pictures in there. But there's good reason <clears throat> that uh, we find so many trout down there. For, for one thing, German Gulch is a major spawning tributary um, for these trout species. It's also a big source of cold, clean water, which is particularly important during the summer months. Um, fish tend to congregate there get into that cold, clean water, and um, they actually will uh, redisperse in the fall as things cool down. And we know that through several lines of evidence. Um, one of them was a master's project that was done in 2010 and 2011. And Joe Naughton, he went out and, and looked at trout abundance and distribution and tried to relate water quality parameters such as copper, uh, nutrients, and dissolved oxygen to that distribution and abundance. And what he found is that during the hot summer months, he basically couldn't find trout just downstream of Butte, downstream of the wastewater treatment plant. And what he found is that during the night, dissolved oxygen concentrations were dipping to levels that were no longer suitable for trout. And I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism for that in just a second, but um, he came back and, and he actually had, had tags in these fish. And then he found that as things cooled down during the fall, fish would actually recolonize into that area. Um, and, and the same thing would, would repeat itself during the summer. They would leave again as those oxygen uh, concentrations went back down. So what drives those oxygen fluctuations are the aquatic plants. So like all plants, they photosynthesize during the day, the sun is out, they're producing lots of oxygen. Then at night, photosynthesis stops, but everything that's alive in that creek starts respiring. They start using up oxygen. So you get these big swings, these big dips in oxygen. And so at night, at least in the past, they could dip to levels that were not good for trout. And a few years back, Butte upgraded, improved their wastewater treatment plant, which has apparently improved the oxygen conditions in the creek. Um, and this is just a, a, a graph from some monitoring that, that we did uh, just this past year. And it's much improved from that 
um, you know, two milligrams per liter that Joe found during his thesis. However, we continue to see that same pattern of fish distribution in our, in our sampling that we do. So what you're looking at here is um, fish trout catch rates in our electrofishing surveys at a Ramsey section, which is again, a little bit far down, farther downstream of town and that German Gulch section in both August and October. And we express that as fish caught per minute of electrofishing time. It's just our sort of index of how many fish are out there or how abundant are they. And so what we find that during August, it's pretty hard to find a trout in that Ramsey section, which is that same section that was going hypoxic when Joe Naughton was doing his thesis. But we do catch lots of trout at that German Gulch section, which has that cold, clean water input. And then when we come back in October, we're catching roughly equal numbers at those two sections. So it does appear that they're redistributing out as that water cools down, potentially as the oxygen concentrations improve. So there's still something limiting the trout population, particularly in the reaches of Silver Bow Creek downstream of, of Butte. And we're not sure exactly what it, what it is. It used to be oxygen, it still may be a factor. It's something we need to keep lo looking into. Well, we talked about nutrients and plants and oxygen in Silver Bow Creek, but it's also a factor in the Clark Fork River itself. If you ever driven down I-90 towards Missoula in August and see these bright green patches of algae, that's Cladophora. And we know that Cladophora can also impact oxygen concentrations, particularly in these interstitial spaces between the rocks. And that's where the aquatic bugs like to live and those bugs are um, food for fish. So we wonder what, what do these blooms mean, mean to fish? And uh, fortunately, this is uh, a topic that both NRDP and the university has taken on head on. Uh, the university system has a virtual army of graduate students out there working on uh, the food web as it relates to this stuff on up from the algae to the bugs and on up to the fish. And we're, we're really happy that research is going on. We're happy um, to be uh, participating in it. And another big limiting factor, and you heard me mention it earlier, is water temperature. And this is something that is a factor um, all over the place in, the main stem, in these main stem habitats. This is a temperature graph from Silver Bow Creek down near Miles Crossing. Um, and what we see is temperatures during the hot summer months, at least the max temperatures are exceeding those thresholds that are good for trout, particularly our native cutthroat trout. If you go farther downstream on the Clark Fork River, say near Deer Lodge, temperatures are even higher. They'll approach 25 degrees, which according to laboratory studies should be lethal to brown, even brown trout. And, it'll, and they'll hit those temperatures for weeks during those, especially during those really hot drought years like we've had in the past. And this is a tough one um, to try, try to address because sources of cold, clean water are not uh, you know, super abundant, but it is something we need to try to tackle as we're trying to put together this restoration jigsaw puzzle um, for the Clark Fork Basin. The other big limiting factor that comes up a lot is habitat. Well, fish, trout in particular, need places to hide. They need cover. And the type of places they like to hide are under overhanging vegetation, in woody debris, like this pile you see in this picture here, undercut banks, stuff like that. And the problem is, is that because of all the contamination in the basin, a lot of these areas kind of lacked vegetation. We talked about those slicken areas, they have no vegetation at all. So those, some of those kind of habitats were limited to begin with. And then we have these remedial activities, the cleanup that come, come along and remove all the contaminants. But in that process, they also remove what vegetation was there. Of course, they replant it, but it, you know, it takes years for that stuff to mature. So there's a lot of interest in um, how, that, how those habitat factors sort of evolve after uh, remedial activities. So we've partnered again with Clark Fork Coalition to sort of inventory um, habitat conditions in remediated and unremediated parts of the upper Clark Fork River and um, look at how it evolves over time. Here we are snorkeling for fish. We're attempting to um, 
you know, basically associate trout with these different habitat features and try to figure out which of these features to trout really tend to key into, which ones do they really seem to need, and uh, which ones are the most important. And the last sort of limiting factor I'm going to talk about today is connectivity. Um, like I said before, trout have complex life histories. They'll often move long distances to complete all the stuff they need to do during their lifetime. And a common life history is to go up in, upstream into tributaries to spawn, but that can be pretty difficult if there's things like irrigation diversions in the way. And then if they do manage to get up there to spawn, their offspring might have a hard time getting back downstream to the main stem if they're sucked into an irrigation ditch on their way down. So there's a lot of work, restoration go work going on to screen these diversions to keep those fish from being entrained into these ditches on their way back downstream and generally just improve fish passage at these dams. So we're going to be doing quite a bit of monitoring to try to evaluate these type, type, type of projects going forward. So you've heard me talk about all these limiting factors and I hope it's not all doom and gloom because despite all these issues, the fishing can be pretty great in both Silver Bowl Creek and the Upper Clark Fork River. They have tremendous potential. And, you know, Silver Bowl Creek in particular, I mentioned downstream of Derman Gulch. Folks have tried to started figuring out that that's, that's a pretty good place to go fishing. I just think it would be really neat if we could find a way to uh, expand the distribution and abundance of trout so that we had really great fishing all the way up to Butte. So I think it'd be great to have, you know, a really quality fishery just outside of town. I think that would be great for the community. So I think we really need to work on figuring out what limiting factors in Silver Bow Creek are keeping that, that from happening currently. And the Clark Fork River, it's the same story. There can be great fishing there. Um, in certain reaches, certain part, parts of the year. But we really need to get a handle on uh, minimizing these sort of short-term impacts, these fish kills, simplification of habitat. And we wanna maximize the sort of long-term benefits of all this cleanup work and restoration that's going on. And to do that, we can't do that alone. We have, we have to collaborate with um, our agency partners, uh, the university system, NGOs, there's a lot of smart people working up in this basin and we need to leverage all of that uh, work and intellect to do the best thing for the resource. And on our end, we're gonna to continue to monitor trends as, as they relate to contamination and cleanup. We're gonna to continue to study the effects of nutrient inputs and the reduction in those inputs on fish. Um, again, we're collaborating with the university system. Uh, Dr. Nagasetti, here at Tech is also going to be looking at that on Silver Bowl Creek. Uh, it sounds like he's got a graduate student to look at um, macrophyte growth, nutrients, and dissolved oxygen, and they're maybe even going to fly some drones, so that's always cool. And we're going to continue to study and address temperature and flow issues and try to look for sources of cold, clean water. And last but not least, we're going to look for some common sense ways to address, address uh, habitat concerns. That's all I've got for you. Um, I guess bonus points for anyone that can tell me what fish are in this picture. And I guess if we've got time for questions, I'll take some of those. Thank you. They're, they're not trout, which I hopefully I didn't talk too much about trout. This one back here, I think, is a shiner red side shiner. And these are little juvenile uh, mountain whitefish, which are by far <laughs> comprised by far the most biomass of any species in the Upper Clark Fork River, for, Upper Clark Fork River, probably four to 10 to one to trout uh, in terms of pounds of whitefish to pounds of trout in the river. So we need to pay attention to them too and what they're telling us and how they respond to all these actions too. That's my little plug for the uh, underdogs of the fish world. Yes, you were first back there. Um, have you 
Absolutely, yes. There's um, there's large irrigation ditches that come off upstream of Deer Lodge, and that's also where the most heavily dewatered, dewatered reach is. Um, so, and I mean, there's years that the documented flow is going to like four CFS there. So it's clearly irrigation withdrawals that are driving some of the low flows in certain areas, particularly for sure. But um, at the same time, there's reaches of upstream of that that are not really impacted by diversion. So it depends on where you look, but that's certainly a huge factor and um, you know, something that we need, to, we need to keep in mind. Oh, uh, they were asking to repeat the questions. I just saw it went up. Hi, Josh. Uh, yes, he just asked me uh, about irrigation diversions and flow and temperature. And if we looked at the relationship there, and I just mentioned that, yeah, there's a clear relationship it's especially evident just upstream of Deer Lodge, uh, you know, downstream of the West Side Ditch, where we see flows getting as low as four CFS some years. Um, I think you had. That's a great question. So the question was, um, what may a slick and high risk or low risk in our slick and assessment? And that was something we just, we had to sort of develop on the fly. I, I'm not sure anyone had done an assessment quite like that. So we looked at two different factors. We looked at what was the risk that the river was actually gonna move into that slicken. So because those slickens are on those meander tabs, they're at risk for the, of the river actually moving around because rivers do that. And in some areas, it's actually cut straight across those meander tabs through the slickens. And so based on the elevation of those slickens and sort of if we saw the you know, river water actually flowing over those slickens during high water, we ranked that as a high avulsion risk. So we had, there was avulsion risk and then we had another category that we called surface erosion risk. And that was more like that slick and I talked about with the fish kill where you have a big rainstorm and then it just slushes a bunch of stuff in the water. And we judged that based on looking at slick and if we could see evidence that that sort of thing was happening. So you could see a flow path leading directly to the river, then it would be higher risk than one that was, you know, 100 yards from the river and had a big ring of vegetation around it and didn't have a clear flow path to the river. So that's basically how we had two categories of surface erosion and avulsion risks. We categorize each, each one differently based on that. Regarding this question, I mean, I ask, uh, what do you expect? How long would the ex would the effect for those uh, quick fixes uh, last? Because we saw those straw bales put up. I, I guess they hold for a while, but until they will be clean cleaned up, they they can still be risked because this the straw bales can can just flow away as well with a bigger flood, right? So what do you what do you expect? What how much do they? How much how much does it work? Um, well, what I've, what I've heard folks say that we're involved in putting those in is that about a year and a half is what they're hoping and that should stem that time until cleanup comes through and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, Josh, Robert asked if, um, you know, what he thought the lifetime of those straw bale berms would be and um, it's about a year and a half okay. is what we're hoping. And, and then uh, just kind of regarding to this question, uh, what did you see as for the effect of these burn breaks? So, so how far did the fish kills happen from the burns? I guess it depends on how much material gets into the water, but maybe how, what's the nature of the material too, right? Like how loaded was it with the toxins? But what did you experience? To me, it was like, I thought it was quite close to where you saw the burns happen. I don't know, could you tell that? So Robert asked um, basically how far downstream yes. do we see effects from that fish kill? Uh, is that, yes. am I yes. summing that? And it was, it was pretty close to, to those particularly offending slickens that we looked at within a mile, you know, I'd say eight tenths of a mile. Um, that's not to say there weren't effects other places, but that's where 
we coming back days later found dead fish. And so, you know, it does beg the question, question where are these events happening in other places? We're just not out there to detect them. Um, we're, we're not just seeing, um, not out there to see those dead fish. So that's just what we saw on that particular day. Further question Thank from you. Judah. Yes. Um, when the restoration efforts continue again for those phases, um, are you guys concerned about large declines in fish populations as the restoration work starts? Do they start pairing up and moving that line first again? And have you guys thought about what you can do to prevent or to input during that restoration process, I guess, as far as keeping those trout numbers maintained or so if I heard your question, uh, is if we're concerned about decreases in the population as the cleanup is coming through because of potential contamination from the cleanup itself or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I would say as you clean up, I'm sure there's going to be some movement of soil. They're not complete. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, as the cleanup goes through, they're removing vegetation and digging up the earth, which is contaminated. And that has, that is a concern. It's been a concern. Um, that's something that uh, was a big impetus for that cage fish study that I mentioned. Um, we would specifically put those cages downstream of where they were working. And we didn't, we didn't see any related, you know, mortalities that we could relate to the actual construction activities. Um, and they, they do their own erosion control to try to keep that stuff from running into the river while they're doing that. And so far, it seems like that, that stuff is working. Um, I will say we electrofished just a few weeks ago through where they're working down at Grant Coors, and there was a ton of trout there. So, so far, it seems like it's doing okay there. But it's something we're gonna continue to monitor and keep our eye on. Yes. So you mentioned that most of the upper Clark Fork River is dominated by like brown trout and other non-native. Do you think there'll be efforts in the near future to establish more of a native population or just kind of trout in general is the biggest concern now? So the question is, um, because the upper Clark Fork is dominated by brown trout right now, um, is our, do we have any plans to try to get more native fish in there in the future? And we do, we're hopeful. We actually have a goal of 10% native fish in those reaches. And 10% doesn't sound a lot, like a lot, but it's actually a pretty lofty goal given the challenges that we have, um, you know, with climate change, uh, with these non-native species. Um, so if we can get 10% native cutthroat and maybe some bull trout in there, we're going to be really happy. And um, that's where the work in the tributaries, I think, is really important, is trying to establish that connection because our native fishes, cutthroat and bull trout, native trout anyway, they tend to be in the upper reaches of those tributaries and we want to create a safe pathway for them into the main stem and then within the main stem itself so they can live there and, and reside there. That's sort of the, the idea anyway. Cool. Any more questions from the audience? There's one more in the back there. Can you go through the slides and go back to the picture of the uh, bluegill burn? I can't go. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I can't it might have been me. Uh, maybe you can try now. Thanks. Uh, so, what exactly classified the failure with Argo's burn, and what was wrong with their design? What hmm. led y'all to decide that was the correct solution? So the question was. Um, what, how do we sort of decide that the original berms around these slickens were failing? And then how were these um, sort of straw bale berms going to sort of uh, address those failures of the, the initial berms? Well, I, I guess I'll just say that those original berms were put in there as just a very short term solution, uh, but they ended up working for almost 30 years now. And it's just in the last three or four or five years that we've really seen them start to blow out and seen these big massive failures. So uh, 
Well, I call them call it a failure because they're blowing out. I think the project on, as a whole was a success. They worked for a long time, longer than anyone expected, probably. And so um, I think the approach here with these straw bales was, you know, again, with a, just a very short time window, and it's just in areas that are going to be cleaned up in the next year or two, two, two three years. And, um, you know, we wanted to construct them out of something that wasn't slickened material. We didn't want to just go in and dig all that stuff and build berms. So it was the most cost effective, um, you know, sort of short term solution that we could come up with. There's a question actually out there too, but Natasha had one, and I'm not sure if we're getting her towards the end of the class, but there is Bleak Bill McGregor's question here. Okay, Natasha, I think, was first. Let's start yeah. with that. So I'm just wondering um, when you guys are, you know, in terms of your live cleanup going on and the things that are in the rooms and that, um, the things that, um, and I'm, I'm sorry I missed it, so I apologize, but um, during that, are you guys going to be implementing more kind of like with those, you know, like for the animal meanders and um, where you can take that opportunity to? Well, the, the cleanup itself is being done in such a way that, um, you know, removing that material and planting plants such as willows is going to hopefully facilitate the development of those habitat features over time. It may take years, maybe even decades, you know, for that stuff to fully mature. And so that's the big, the big habitat improvement that, you know, sort of long term picture. Um, there's also, you know, certain bank treatments that are placed here and there to try to, you know, sort of kickstart and provide a little habitat um, for fish over the shorter time periods. And, you know, our agency is hoping, you know, we can see more and more of that in the future because we do know that that's something limiting uh, it was limiting to be, begin with and it becomes very limited after cleanup. So yeah, we're hoping to see more, use, more and more use of those habitat specific kind of bank treatments going into the future. I guess Bill has that question out there. Uh, I'll do, can you read it? Uh, uh, it looks like the question is how do current levels of temperature and flow rate compare to with what they might have been before settlement of the area? What was the original flow and temp like? Well, I guess since I'm not that old and I wasn't around pre-settlement, I, I just have to assume that um, at least temperature conditions were quite different. Um, there wasn't irrigation withdrawals like we talked about before. Um, so we wouldn't have that heavy, heavy dewatering, particularly in that upstream of Deer Lodge area. Um, I would also assume that temperatures were lower. For instance, we see a big temperature increase as Silver Bowl Creek flows through uh, Butte, which is typical for an urban stream. An urban environment uh, tends to be warmer. You get surface runoff over things like asphalt. That can all raise the temperature. Um, we've got, you know, the Warm Springs ponds, which are very shallow, wide, um, ponds, they absorb a lot of solar energy and there's some warming there as well. So I think overall, we'd see more water and it was colder and, um, you know, potentially you might see more of those cold water. Well, obviously you'd have more native fish because brown trout weren't stocked everywhere by then. So you'd have more cold water specialists like bull trout and West Slope cutthroat trout at that time. I hope I answered your question there, Bill. Well, I, I've been told that we're getting close to the time here, but we, if there's anyone else on Zoom that has a, have any, has a quick question, um, we could do that. Otherwise, we might adjourn here. I just had a quick question on what you thought um, the Warm Springs ponds might be like negatively impacting the fish populations. Because I know there's like a lot of um, kind of like uncertainty about like what's going on with like water chemistry and whatnot and how that relates to the Clark Fork River and um, surrounding uh, different tributaries of the Clark Fork? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, the, one of the, the biggest impacts of the ponds, at least that we've seen in the past, is that they're very productive. There's a lot of uh, plant growth in there and that makes also a lot of um, invertebrate growth. And some of those invertebrates, namely 
scuds spill right out of the ponds and provide food for fish. Um, so we see pretty rapid of growth of fish downstream of the ponds and I think it actually attracts fish to that area during certain times of year. So it's the, wa the water just downstream of those ponds is clearly a feeding area for trout. In terms of the water quality issues and what, what those might mean for trout, um, well, certainly the warmer water coming out of them um, is not ideal, especially you know, during the warm summer months when water is already warm coming in there and in the rest of the, of the creek itself. And in terms of the other water quality stuff, um, you know, we thought for years there, there could be pulses of toxic stuff like ammonia, um, but we've just never been able to nail that down or see those kind of impacts for ourselves. Um, we do know that they are, are pretty effective in reducing the amount and the um, toxicity of metals of copper and zinc downstream of those ponds. So they're still functioning in that way. And so, so certainly in the past, they've been a net benefit to fisheries. Um, whether they're still serving that role or not, I guess that's up for debate and, and into the future what their role will be. So that's something that we're all going to have to wrap our heads around for sure. All right. I think we should adjourn. Thank you. Well, we're thanking so much. Uh, Nina, you give your final